Okay, hello everyone. On behalf of the UFT Men's Issues Awareness Society, thank you for coming and I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Take it away, Steve. Thanks, Jeff. I'm Steve. I'm here with the Canadian Association for Equality. We're sponsoring tonight's event. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know about us, there's a table outside with some pamphlets and there's a sign up sheet that you can that you can add your name to to be on our email list to find out about similar events to this one. Uh, we are an educational charity and we try to uh, incorporate issues affecting men and boys into the discussion of gender. So that's our, our focus. Uh, we sponsor events like this, as I say. And we also have um, some social services for men, some support groups, uh, legal clinic, and uh, working on a shelter in Toronto, so that's all uh, that's what we do. So tonight we have Dr. Thomas Ankar, very exciting to have. He's a psychiatrist at St. Michael's Hospital, and he's going to talk to us about his work and his uh, video series. So please welcome Dr. Ankar. rushing over. I actually was here about 20 minutes ago to set up the computer, but my GPS took me north of Lawrence St. George for some reason. And so I ran down. And so anyways, you know what happens. And you kind of see the signs that save a life from time. Really, really like this. So it's quite something. You know, so nice to be here. So I have all kinds of things I can talk about with you, but it's really hard to give a presentation when I don't know if I'm going to connect with you. It's what you're hoping for. Um, so I just want to know about what you're hoping for. I did a web series, a men's mental health web series. There's a video to show, I can show but half of an episode, which is like 10, 15 minutes, and <coughs> things, we can talk about it. I do stigma work and, and equity research work lately. I'm an educator, I used to be a family doctor, a psychiatrist, I uh, work at St. Michael's, where I'm the chief psychiatrist. So, just want to go around, what are you hoping for? Is there anything that brought you to this topic so I know how to hear it? But I'm not going to throw all my crap, right? So, let me start with that. Anything? You don't have to talk for long, I'm just curious. I'm hoping to maybe get a handle on how to a system that really need more uh, psychiatric care uh, but is resistant to do so not mostly because of stigma because of perceived risks to his for example uh, custody or and so forth. A person, an individual person. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Just, just general information. Okay. Pretty much the same thing. Yeah. I'd say mental health intervention in general, whether it's for an acute crisis or whether it's for someone that just doesn't have their life together and won't get their life together. Generally, men's mental health is often not spoken about as right. much as it should be. It's right. mental health in general and then women's mental health. And so any insights around that, and, and personally I come from a public health viewpoint, so prevention is, is always an interesting thing for me. But uh, any, any insights you have are really interesting to hear. Yeah, I guess I was thinking about treatments and resources. All resources. Yeah. Okay. Back, anyone else? Okay. okay, so let me now think for a moment, because I have a talk which goes kind of on the stigma topic, which I think a lot of your questions are getting service, how do you get someone's help, why is it not taken as seriously, why do guys keep it private, and there's a whole gender thing there too, and socialization, but I think, because I, I, I was a family doctor, I went back to psychiatry, and I was the educator of family doctors, and I've gone across the country, designed education programs for them, 
And you know, I give them multiple choice tests, they know all the right answers, but even my colleague physicians, they don't do what I would like to see them do sometimes. They're hesitant, and I was one of those. Uh, so that got me thinking about how much am I going to educate if it's not actually changing their behavior, the outcome. Uh, so then everyone got into the stigma thing. There's some wonderful things going on in the media, the Bell Let's Talk campaign, <coughs> things like that. Uh, but that's focusing on attitudes. And I said, so I really got into that, and I kind of did some research and works. I could talk a bit about that. And then I got invited by the Mental Health Commission of Canada to co-write a, a learning module for physicians and other health providers. So it got me into the content, so I can share some ideas with you. I don't think you've answered everything because that's a pretty broad spectrum. But we can touch on it, because I think the big barrier, not only men's mental health, but all mental health, even worse with guys, and even worse with certain cultural groups, uh, is people don't think it's real. And they think you're weak, or not trying hard, or you're personally morally flawed. So they moralize, or they psychologize it. I slightly biologize it, hopefully not too much. So I'll take you through a few of those ideas, and then lead you to how I decided to not just tell people what the symptoms and do it, because then they don't, you know, look, that's kind of like parenthood statements. Uh, to actually doing a video series to try and <coughs> take people first, and maybe then filter out some information and change pop culture and this idea of uh, stigma and avoiding care. Is that reasonable? Should I sit through that? Do you want to see the, a bit of a video first, or do you want me to go through sort of theory and talk and then show you the video? Let's see the video. Okay. So I did a video series. People agreement? Hands up for video first. Hands up, please. Okay, thank you. Democracy wins. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so there was a the Movember Men's Health Charity put out an innovation grant competition. I was successful in getting that. And my what I liked about it wasn't traditional research where you know give us a 30-page proposal and then tell them what you're going to do or five years exactly. Because I don't work like that. Because if I find something I need, one that doesn't work, I change what I do. So that doesn't work with the proposal. So they follow the innovation process, which is changing what you discover and turning left and right and tweaking something, like when you design a product or thing. So um, my idea was to say, well, I told everyone about this. There's this method we use here at UT Medical School and other medical schools where they take standardized patient actors, where they train to portray a medical condition, and then the students practice on them. Practice interview, they may practice physical examination on them. So I thought, you know, I go. I got my haircut yesterday. Thank you. It's nice. Mm -hmm. uh, the hairdresser is all full of advice. I right? like to chatter sometimes. The bartender sometimes full. Of, so I said, oh, people like to give advice. I got this method of med school with patients. What if we did a reality TV show where I took people who thought they're good at giving advice? They're the contestants, and we throw them in front of one of the standardized patient actors. That would be ridiculously silly. Kind of, and then judges, real people, comment on. That we could have a lot of fun with that. What would that look like? Uh, and secondarily, without even knowing it, you're watching the actor portray a health condition, so you're learning about the condition. And the ultimate message that I wanted to get through is just go for help. Uh, and maybe I don't want to talk about it, but I'll watch a fun show and I see something. I don't want to tell you that I have that condition, but maybe if I see somebody doing it through modeling, it might kind of change <laughs> pop culture. So we did a web series, we did six episodes, they're on YouTube, they're free. Uh, three of them I took off and then we improved them and put them back on. We did a research study on it, showed it worked. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about the idea. I'm trying to pitch it to see what else we can do with the thing. Uh, there's six episodes. Four of the episodes are mental health. Two are physical health, where the worry is the guy doesn't want to get checked out and go for help because guys don't like to ask for help. They feel vulnerable. Again, I did research and, and read up on the literature on men's health behaviors, which tend to be don't look weak, don't look vulnerable, don't go for help, tough it out kind of socialization. Hopefully we're getting over some of that, but that's prominent. So how do we kind of tackle that? So I thought the video series was a safer way to get people to watch it, particularly mental health, which has its whole other layer of stigma, because people don't always think it's real. And I'll show you some of the research we've done on that. Because they don't look the biology of it, right? It's not I'm trying hard, it's not anything you do. It's like, you know, I could get my blood pressure, high cholesterol, I could get a mental health problem. It's just a health condition, it's not you. People don't think of it that way. Um, so, I have three episodes here. We're going to go also. Uh, there's one on depression. It's good, but when you watch it, it's a bit sad to watch. Oh, um, Doctor, can you have your website, uh, please? Yeah, so I'll tell you in a minute. I think you can shrink. Careful. You can shrink. 
And you've got to keep the buses for shrinking. You think you can shrink? You don't think you can dance? Think you can judge? Um, there's a depression one. There's an anger management one, which is really a narcissistic personality. Not before Donald Trump was in office, I found this. I found it. Uh, and there's one I have here. It's a little different for a guy who's really nervous about disclosing his health problem. He's got a lump on his testicle. It's kind of more comical because it lends itself to more comical. So, testicle, depression, anger management. Anger management. That's my vote. That's your vote. Hands up for anger management. Hands up for depression. Okay, hands up for testicular lump. Okay, we'll do depression. I guess we'll do that. It's a little more on the serious side, but let's do that. Um, there are two contestants. I'll start it off and I'll probably advance. I might advance to the second contestant. That's smart because I don't think you want to watch that. Sound okay? Trigger warning in case anyone gets upset or personal. It does. The portrayal of the actor is quite realistic, quite serious. They get into the serious symptoms of depression. Um, so if that's concerning to you, just be forewarned, let me know. Anybody <coughs> want to change or anything or no pain? What's the YouTube channel? Uh, you should just look up Think You Can Shrink. Think You Can Shrink on YouTube and thinkyoucanshrink.com on uh, the website with the episodes and there's the research studies published. Uh, so everything's up to Think You Can Shrink. Oh, so it was possibly an attempt? Possibly a suicide attempt. Uh, okay, okay. 
to get out the seriousness of a, of a medical depression condition. Right, right. And this has been, I guess, for, for, for my character, it's, it's been something that's slowly built over a period of time, or the, or just one knock after the other, where he's being, he's, you know, things are things haven't gone the way he wanted them to go. Yeah, so it starts like that with the not that right. it takes on the life of its own. So over three right. months, it's just kind of developed. And now it's not even knocks, it's just his own condition yeah. that's brewing and it's actually yeah. making things look worse than they actually are. The whole goal is we want the guy to try and get you to, to get you to recognize you need help. Right. The guys don't like to talk about stuff. A lot of people don't. They don't. <laughs> For my character, the situation that he's in, he, he probably can't feel like he can talk to anybody. It's a difficult area for, for any, for any, especially guys, right, to talk about. And so, added layer of this is that it's, it's a, it's a blind improvisation in the sense that the other partner in this, i.e., the, the guys that are coming in, don't necessarily know that they're improvising. They so I, you know, I mean, I have, you know, the challenge for me is, is to be able to guide them through their choices yeah. by giving them the help whilst still being in character and believable. How far can I take it? Can I, you know, can I, uh, you know, challenge them? I guess I can, right? Because, yeah. uh, you know, they don't know that I'm not, that this isn't real. You know? I mean, so you can take it as far as you want, as long as it feels authentic, it sure. can go anywhere, yeah. really. I find improvising, even with a script, you know, when we're working in rehearsals and things like that, I find it. Improvisation is a, is a real good tool to bring out stuff, so I'm, I'm quite at home improvising. This is a whole new level. And, uh, you were hoping for a time to be right this year. Well, yes, yeah, so it is. That's what my agent told me. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping, you know, to, uh, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of focus and a lot of concentration. Okay, so, do you think you're ready for this? Um, I hope so, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to need a, yeah, I need a few moments to uh, right. to get you know, to, to do this to do a service thing to do it. I'm here. I'm here for the end. So I will work well, definitely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Excellent. Yeah, I think I'll have to be uh, on my game. <laughs> Talking to Tim today is Eddie, a former store <coughs> owner, and Marcus, a bartender. Let's meet Marcus. My name is Marcus. Marcus. I work as a bartender and. It didn't rush Yeah, same. Yeah, I'm improvising. This is a whole trail of progress with people coming from you know, all the jobs I've had. I've been a long way. I'm from like, yeah, that's the way to go because it's. Uh, I remember, I remember, I remember. Both our contestants know nothing about the patient they're about to meet. So while Marcus gets ready to meet Tim, let's meet our judges. First, we're really lucky to have with us the co host of ET Canada. Rick Campanelli. Thank you, Tom. I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Psychiatrist extraordinaire, Dr. Robert Weinstein. Thank you, Tom. And family and emergency room physician, Dr. Jean-Pierre Champagne. Thank you, Tom. Let's see how Marcus does. Want to plant the seed all on its own. See this. Eddie. A situation and a situation. I'm a private chef and a part-time actor. In my past life, I ran a strip club for about 20 years. I really had a great time in those 20 years. I learned a lot and met a lot of great people. But sometimes in life, you just gotta change and there's, there was something out there calling me. So I quit, went to culinary school, appeared on a few cooking shows. Then I started doing uh, some private chefing. I cooked for a few families in downtown Toronto. I also started uh, doing a little part-time acting. I also have an internet business uh, where I sell useless junk to people who don't need useless junk. I do a lot of stuff. I keep myself busy. I like to listen to music and I like to play. Strumming a guitar, or even sometimes you just want to get the drums out and make a big noise, make a big bang. It all makes you feel good. So unwinding doesn't always have to Quiet. You know, unwinding could be you know, getting some stress out, getting some frustration out, getting something out. Music's a great thing for that. I 
love people, and I love talking to people, and I love to get to know people. The great thing about people is everybody has a story. Everybody has a background. Everybody has something going. And I'll be honest, being uh, an extrovert that I am, you meet people and you find and dig something out of you just by saying hello. Everybody, see that? You can like face like that, eh? Hello, the owner. It's okay. Have a nice day. Take care yourself. I think people like to. Uh, ask me for my opinion, they like to be around me and gravitate towards me because I tell the truth. I don't tell people what they want to hear. Now, that upsets people sometimes, and sometimes, you know, they get a little, they get their, their feathers ruffled from it. But listen, if you didn't want to know the truth, why did you ask me? I think I could shrink, because I tell the truth. I'm an older guy, I've been through a lot of stuff, and, uh, People always come to me for advice. Because they know chances are anyone through it, most likely. And he's gonna tell us, he's not embarrassed, he's gonna tell us exactly what happened, what happened to him, and how he dealt with it. And that's what I do. Hey. How are you? I'm good. Hey. Eddie. Eddie, I'm Tim. How's it going, Tim? Well, I 
always go out and drink with them. Hey, buddy, yeah. hey, you know, that's great. That's great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for ruining it. There's like, there's not as much as Yeah. There's like, start. There's like, start. Go get yourself two coffees. Okay? Yeah. Walk by his office casually, you know, somewhere where you know he's going to be. And you walk by, this is how you start. And you're like, oh, what's his name? Do you know his name? Steve. Steve, Steve how are you? Hi, Tim, remember me? I'm gonna, listen, I got two mochaccinos here. You're more than welcome to have one. Who's not going to accept a mochaccino? Of course he's going to accept it. So now that's the icebreaker. Okay? Yeah. That's how it starts. The next day, you do it again. But the next day, you start asking him, hey, listen, we never, you know, that's funny, we never, uh, I've heard about you, we've never spoken, we've never really met, you know? Start telling him about your family, your kids, ask him if he has kids, he probably has a family, he has kids, he has a beautiful wife. You start, you know, getting to know him. Now, the next day, you ask him out, give me a casual beer, a beer after work, something like that. You're building a relationship, you're building trust. If you really want to get, uh, find out, does he like sports? What does he like? You know, does he like hockey? Does he like baseball? Does he like NASCAR? Does he like strip clubs? Find out and Ask them, hey, listen, I got two tickets. Now, do you not believe that uh, investing your money in two tickets is worth keeping your job? Of course you do, Tim. I can tell you're a smart guy. It just seems like it. It just seems, it seems like a great idea to keep your job? Absolutely. I don't care about my job. You don't care about your job? No. Why am I here, Tim? Why am I here? Okay, so what's the problem then? You don't care about losing your job? Uh, guys, I hope that they're uh, on a low floor in that room because uh, <laughs> I'm afraid that uh, Tim's gonna just out the window. <laughs> he is very aggressive. He oh is very God. aggressive, man. No, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and with the, this topic right here, you, you just can't be that way. Yeah. You have to be a little more sensitive, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the one thing I find very striking about Eddie is that the one thing he does virtually not in any way is listen to the patient. And you can tell Eddie is a problem solver. This is what I got. You buy some tickets, you get a couple of copies. Bingo, 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 bingo. Eddie, and I bet, I'm sure he comes from nothing but the most genuine good intentions, but he, all he wants to do is fix the solution again. And maybe it's worked for Eddie, but, perhaps, for but it's not going to work for everyone. You know, the other thing too is that Tim is giving him a lot of physical cues that this that Eddie's not getting it. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. Eddie, again, is still so focused on that final solution that he's not picking up on any of that. I don't care about anything. Right? So it's more than the job. There's more problems. Well, that's, uh, that's one way of looking at it, yeah. Okay, you don't have cancer, do you? Yeah. Well, no. they got no problems in life. A job, I don't worry about This is what you do. Now, if you told me you had cancer, but the fact that, you know, the job, you need to support your family, Tim. So you can't say you don't care about your job. You can't say that. Of course you care about your job. Because how else are you going to support your family? So now, this is what you're going to do for the job. Get to know your boss. Get tight with your boss. Be friends with your boss. He won't fire you up. Trust me. You guys can be laughing it up, high-fiving each other in the hallway, doing that kind of thing when you guys are passing each other on the elevator. That'll take care of that. What's your other problem, Tim? You said it's not just a job. You said you don't care about other stuff. No. Yeah. Like what? What gives you pleasure in life right now? Uh, you make it sound really very easy. Uh, but what's hard about it? What's hard? Everything. But it's not. You're making it hard. I'll be honest. You're making it hard. And what? Well, okay, so uh, what if I just gotta just like go, hey, snap out of it. Here's a coffee. No, it's a start. It's a start. Of course you're not gonna snap your fingers, but it's a start. The coffee is a start. You having problems at home? You fighting with your wife and kids? Maybe some flowers. Maybe uh, taking the dinner. All these little things that you gotta start using to patch things up slowly. 
Remember, you didn't get yourself in this problem like within a day, right? It wasn't an overnight thing. No, of course it wasn't. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to get yourself out of it like that. It's always hard. Remember, falling into a hole is easy. <whistles> getting up, getting back out is always harder. What happens? What happens if I don't? There is no what happens. You're going to ask me what happens if I don't get out? If I don't want to get out. You have to get out. You got to change that. You got to change that attitude. Because <laughs> if you have that attitude, yeah, you're you're doomed to fail. Maybe I am. Well, that's part of the attitude. You yeah. got to get rid of that attitude. You make it sound very easy. <laughs> you know, I I hear this all of the time. That when it comes to depression, you just gotta change the way you think. You just got, you just got, you have to easy. do it. It's like Moonstruck, snap out of it. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So the thing is, though, depression is no different in a number of ways than, say, diabetes. And you would never say to someone, just change your attitude, and your blood sugar will be better. Right? It's the same thing with your mood. It's the thing that people don't understand, and and when people don't understand something, they're gonna give advice like this Absolutely. because this person has obviously never been affected, but or doesn't know anyone that's been affected by depression and, and these thoughts. So of course he's gonna keep um, at his aggressive rate. Yeah. You gotta do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Yeah. And, and if you don't do it, it's on you. Right. You're that makes it worse. Without question, that's gasoline on the fire. Yeah. But you make it sound so hard. Making it sound like this is just this is the way it is. This is what's no, 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 no. There's one. The one phrase I can't stand in life is that's just the way it is. It's a comment. Nonsense. What are you saying? Just go. You know, just get on with it. Trump. If you were sitting here and you were talking to yourself, what advice would you give yourself? I would say that you're a. Uh, Pathetic waste of space, and there's a window out there with a few floors up, so... Go on. You and me both know you would say that. That's exactly what I'm saying myself. No, you wouldn't. Because if I'm not saying it, why would you say it? Your wife? Your kids? You don't want to tell them your problems, right? No. Alright, well here's a problem. Do you think it's fair to your wife and kids that they don't know? <laughs> it's easy for them. Once I'm gone. That's what you think. They'll be gone. Life is easy for you. You're gone. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of selfish, don't you think? You're leaving a family behind, and they got to mourn the fact that you know you did what you you know talk about doing. And I know you don't want to do that, Tim. Okay, come on. I know you don't want. To just be easier. That's what you think. That's what you think. But you're going to selfishly leave your, you know. It's not selfish. I'm oh, helping it's, them. It's I'm self helping you're them. helping nothing. I'm helping them. I'm better off bloody dead. Yes? Do yourself a favor, man. Talk to your family. No. You, you think it's very easy just to talk to my family. Okay? It's not. Talk to them. It's not that simple, all right? Tell your kids, tell it's, your wife. It's gone too far. It's never gone too far. Tell them. You will feel like a like a piano just got lifted off you. Trust me. It won't drop on my head, that'll be easier. It will, you know, you'll feel like a new person, a new man. Tim, do me a favor, please. Sit up. I don't want you to be angry. I don't want you to leave upset. Please. I haven't asked you for anything, right? Have a seat, please. The last thing I'm going to say to you, Tim. Talking always helps. Always. I'm sure deep down inside you really want to tell your family. Whether you do or you don't, which I know you really want to tell them what's going on in your life. And if you're not going to share it with, share it with them, there's no one else you can share it with. Let them know. Everything starts in the home. Tell them. Just tell them. And when you do, it'll feel so much better. It's a start. And then everything else will just start feeling better.
you'll have a clearer head, a clearer heart, a clearer soul. Believe me. Okay. I'm not telling you because I read this in a book. I'm telling you this because I know. Yeah, I don't know. I gotta go. I gotta go ruin someone else's day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good, Good luck, sir. Please. Do what I told you to do. Sorry. Do what I asked you to do. I'm not a savior, man. But I just know a few things about life. I, I, I just... The older you get, the more you learn. All right. All that stuff you were talking about, you're not going to do that. You're not. You're too good a guy. You're too smart a guy. All right. Well, thanks a lot. So, Eddie, how do you think you did? I honestly think I gave the guy some sound advice. If he takes it. But if he does take it, he'll be ahead of the game. Were you frustrated at his taking your advice from that at all? Never. Never get frustrated. Because these are people with problems. And there's no surefire method. So, you know, you just keep with them, keep with them, and make him realize that it's going to be all right. This fellow had some suicidal thoughts and feelings. Uh, do you think you helped that? Yeah, sure I do. I mean, some people, it's just a cry right now. You know what I mean? So, if he really had those tendencies, he would have done it by now. That's what he's talking about. He just needs someone to listen to. So, he's going to be all right. Okay, let's hope so. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. So, judges, between Eddie and Marcus, Oh, well, well, Tom, this, this was a very difficult one here, um, but I think we saw two totally different approaches. We saw a very aggressive approach here with Eddie, and then uh, earlier with Marcus, he was much more laid back, and he's trying to offer what he could. Um, so, I, I mean, Marcus's approach is the one I would definitely go with in a situation like this here, for sure. Uh, he missed all that suicidal stuff, which is a big, big, big oversight. Eddie, Eddie. Eddie did, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll put it to you this way. Marcus just might have saved a life. Yeah. yeah. And that's not the role of someone to have, that, that should not be the imperative of a conversation, because these patients, they need to get speaking. Yeah. But remarkably, Marcus may have just actually saved his life. Thank you, JP. It's true. Even in mental health, we are involved in saving lives. Okay, thank you, judges. Snap out of it, really? That's never a good thing to say to a person with a mental health problem. And he did what a lot of people do, and tried to be helpful, but actually might have made things worse. Marcus was a really good listener and very helpful. And while it's great to talk to a bartender, this person really needed to see professional help. I'm Dr. Tom Sunder, and next time on Think You Can Shrink, we'll have a different problem with two different contestants. And remember, if you've got anything serious going on or any concern, see a doctor and get help. Think you can shrink, or maybe you'll stink. And if you don't stink, then you can shrink.
show you this quick fix solution to a very serious problem that you can't do. But there was no, it was all about Andy. It wasn't about the, the patients. So when we didn't see the first guy who did a really nice job, he listened, he was empathic, he didn't give advice, he just expressed concern and said, go get help. That's it. That, that could be life saving to say it's not your fault, it's, you've got something going on, let's go get you some help. Uh, it encouraged me to talk and it's okay. So creating a safe environment. And he did exactly the opposite. Yeah, and he did what some people do. He was trying to be helpful. He was not a bad guy. He just thought it's just, you know, guys, we like to solve problems. Men are problem solvers. And so I just want to fix it and out. Yeah. And then boom. So and that doesn't work with depression. You need to get help, you need to get professional help. It's not self-imposed, it's not bright, it's not effort. So someone trying to fix it, that's very frustrating. They don't know what to do with that. And so Eddie, to our benefit as a reality contestant, we didn't know what we were going to get. It was terrific to have a guy do a perfect job to show us what you could do really well, and a guy do absolutely the worst job in, or demonstrate things you shouldn't do. And it's cringeworthy to watch. So it's awkward to watch this with our audience and everybody. What, 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 painful sometimes. You know, that's crying. It's a, very sad. Yeah. And there's no questioning about how long the guy's been depressed or what the when the depression started, what sorts of situation he was in, what the no. depression started. No, but I think before you stepped in, there was a scene where I coached the actors, so I kind of gave that kind of, I used this vehicle, this format, to explain to the actors, this is what I want you to portray for a few months now, this has been going. So I kind of gave a class <coughs> to but the depression sister. But the uh, person he was talking no. about didn't ask. Yeah. 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 It was almost humorous how much he thought he was doing a good job. Wasn't that weird? That like it was so painful to watch what he was doing and so grateful that that was an actor and yeah. not a real person talking yeah. to him about that. Yeah. But that he thought he was doing a really good job with it. Of all the episodes, this one I like showing the least because it's so difficult to watch. <laughs> yeah. At some point you told him that was an actor, right? So yes, we did. So he came out of the room, but they didn't know going in. We didn't, mm -hmm. if they asked, we told them, but for this whole ethical discussion, if they asked, we told them, but others, we always show you and go, Give advice to someone who needs help. And then on the way out, he was concerned. He asked me to say, yeah, it's an actor. So, yes, we did talk. We were not, we were not cruel. But, uh, yeah, it was weird. Yeah? Um, so, yeah, like, aside from the fact that he wasn't, um, you know, like, I feel like he should, really should have acknowledged, like, I heard that you have suicidal thoughts and stuff like that and make it, you know, make him feel like he was understood and stuff like that, acknowledge how he was feeling in that regard. But I think he did he did something too that was like also very therapeutic, you know, that maybe got overshadowed by the way that he mishandled that. And that was he was telling him to start doing things, to, you know, like talk to his family, to, you know, reach out to his employers and stuff like that. And obviously this might not have been perfect advice, but what I what I saw was an actor like you know, sort of being resistant to that, and that's that's where I'm sort of like I find it. even in the acting, he yes. was still portraying this like resistance to the stigma of like or surrounding like you know getting outside help for something. And that's sort of, like my my question is more like well, what can you do yep. yourself in, in a treatment situation like that to be able to accept, be more accepting? Okay. So I'll talk about depression. I'll talk about I'll come back to stigma. So. Get help is the message, especially for men. They don't like to talk, they don't like to push help, they feel vulnerable. Go to your family doctor, that's what we do in Canada. Call a crisis line. Those are great things. If it's really an emergency, every emergency room, 24 hours a day, I take call. There's a group of us, and when the emergency room doctors need a specialist, if it's a heart problem, they call the heart specialist. If it's a mental health problem, they call me, the mental health specialist. We do 24 hour a day call to the emergency room on the road up, and we assess people, and we intervene, we give advice. We admit them if they need to. Sometimes it's so dangerous. We, they don't want to come in. We have to for safety. Nobody likes that. Um, and then the treatments are talk therapy, counseling. Make sure nothing else is going on. Your thyroid, your blood sugar that's masquerading as depression. And then other physical, biologic treatments, sometimes medication, sometimes even more uh, other types of bodily treatments, even electroconvulsive therapy, which is a weird one. Everyone gets scared for the movies. But that's done in the most of the hospital because that's probably the most effective treatment in people who need it if they can set, which is a really good treatment. And all kinds of new things we're studying. So avoiding too much drugs and alcohol, exercise is great help, meditation is good help, eating well, social relationships and connectedness, these are all preventive medicine, 
preventions. But if you have this, okay, no one did anything wrong, it's not really, it's just a condition. You get help and we can treat it. I treat it every day and I see people get better all the time. Sometimes it's stubborn, that takes a lot of work, and some people don't, not everybody responds as well as we'd like, and we keep working on new treatments, but that's, that's a treatment. And, but you don't have to know that, just like, what do I do if I get appendicitis? I need to know. No, I don't. I have to go to the hospital and the surgeon takes my appendicitis. Yeah. So you don't have to know exactly what to do. You just need, uh, my, my feeling is just identify, get help, go to a reputable website and get some good information. Not a testimonial from one person who had a certain experience, because that's very good. Go to a good university, a hospital, a good mental health association, and you'll get reasonable information, the realities of the condition, um, for any mental health condition. Guys, though, we, we have the stigma, and I'll just talk a little bit, because I grew up, now, here's a little story, just to tell you why it's extra hard for people to go for help. And my parents were European immigrants, they came to Canada, I was first generation, I was educated, I did well in school, and I got to go to medical school. This was a dream for my family. I got to go to medical school, and my son's going to be a doctor, how wonderful, and I did med school, and I, I graduated, and I, I have to pick a special name, I'm going to do family medicine. Oh, family medicine, my mother, you know? Babies, the grandparents, the whole family is so nice, right? isn't it wonderful? <coughs> and then working for a couple of years, they say, I got news for your mom and dad. They said, What? I said, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to become a specialist. <gasps> a specialist? Oh, yeah, a specialist. It's very exciting. Uh, and I said, What are you going to study? What are you going to study? And then I go, And I just say, Hi, because go, Oh, right? So, right there in their reaction, Oh my God, you're going to catch the illness. Why would you do such a thing? <laughs> All these old beliefs. A cardiologist would have been great. So, I so, I didn't suffer from that, but a lot of people have that false belief still. Yeah, it's your effort, your brains, it's catchy. It's, I just know it's a brain condition, a bodily brain condition that's very treatable. So that's the challenge. And then you add male culture to that, double one. Um, and just to show you a little bit of stuff on stigma, here's just some statistics. You can read them. Uh, one of the major barriers preventing people from getting help, and for men it would be double one. Uh, many people say the stigma they face is often worse than the illness itself. 40% uh, of Canadian parents have been telling like their child had a mental illness. Uh, well, when you do hear a news story, it's a very rare, very unusual one about someone being violent, which is not the wrong thing. I thought it's one of the most common mental health conditions. About 80% of people will have a depression in their lifetime. Uh, three of the top 10 medications used in Canada are mental health medications. So it's bread and butter, boring, normal, like high blood pressure to me. But people, ooh, it's mental health. So, so um, let's just show you a couple. So the actual, this is a little upsetting, but that logo there, that, anybody know what that is? That's me. That, that's a Greek symbol, stigma. It's tattooed or burned or branded in the skin of people that society wanted to easily distinguish, identify as outsiders, different and easy, easily distinguishable from others in society. Stigma can be defined as a mark of disgrace. So that's the root of the word. So now I think we've got this idea that mental health or certain stigmas, mental health being a health stigma, is like that. There's four main kinds of stigma. The social stigma, that's the main one that we talk about. Well, we don't want to talk about our mental health problems or other stigmatized things. Severe social disapproval of a or personal discontent of the person on the grounds of their unique characteristics, distinguishing them from others in society. But what happens is you grow up in that culture and then you develop, and this is what tragic when I see patients, self-imposed stigma. Because they, people believe that they're weak or damaged because of the illness. They're not smart, they're not trying hard or something wrong with them. What a terrible thing to do. So one of the first things I do to tell all people is there's nothing to do with you. It's a health condition like anything else. It's not your brains, it's not your effort, it's just bread and butter, and it's not you as a person and you treat it. So that's the self stigma and that's what prevents people from even asking for help. And prevents guys on top of that from help asking for help. Stigma by association is to the people who deliver and provide care. So I want to do that specialty training. I was at stigma by association because I treat that population. And my colleague doctors don't treat me the way they do every other specialist all the time. They think all of the funny people go to psychiatry or what's wrong with you, you're smart enough to do this. We get this all the time. And the sad part is structural stigma, and this is where my work has gone to now. If we can equitably get the structures to be equitable, I think we can correct a lot of this. Those are insubmissible from Lincoln Fields. <coughs> institutional accumulated practices that work to the disadvantage of mental health patients, even in the absence of individual prejudice or discrimination. This quote, disabling environment, was created by the barriers of participation in receiving care that reside in the architecture structures of the structure. So I went into this question with psychiatry, and guess what? It's the lowest paid medical specialty. What does that tell me about the value of my work? It's not even me, it's the value of the medical <coughs> specialty. You go to any hospital on Ontario, 
probably, not always, but probably the oldest part of the building last to be renovated, most outside the hospital or far out in the woods or separate area, I call it segregated, is probably the medical company. Not always, but more often than not. Oh, do the CEOs get angry when I start talking about this one hospital? Because they're embarrassed, we're not like that. Because they don't mean that. They just they suffer from the same false ideas uh, about mental health and say they're not being real as general public. So we should have targeted that stigma trait. The Medical Health Commission should have targeted not at health providers. They should have gone at the decision makers first. That's the area that talking to the, the CEO uh, of the Mental Health Commission now wishes that that's what we would target first. So that's kind of what makes it extra hard to get health uh, structural stigma. Just go to some solutions now. Um, a couple solutions. There's a lot of articles if you look up on stigma. I've got a few. Uh, just Google it. We get some stuff if you're into it. Um, this guy is who I, this person is who I blame. Anybody know who that might be? Descartes. Yeah, Rene Descartes. Oh, yeah. Dualism. He's, He's a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So he was a philosopher who separated, he's responsible for what we call mind-body dualism. Yeah. Right. And because of that split, it's an artificial split, right? He wanted to study the body, he wanted to dissect it, but the church said you can't touch the body, that's all. That's all whole soulful stuff. So he, he pulled a fast one and said, oh no, I'm not touching the soul. The soul is separate from the body. I'm just playing with the body. You, the church, you got the soul, so that's okay. And the church goes, oh, good idea. Okay, we'll let you do that. So that philosophic split has, I think, continued to permeate everything. Uh, mind, body, mental health, radio, whatever. Why are we mental health and not health? I don't know. The brain organ is different than the heart organ. So it's just this weird split. So I blame this person for a lot of my trouble. <laughs> Whereas my kids said, that is a real ugly dude. Right? So I think so it's, I think this is the foundation. This is my theory, this is the foundation of all it's all in your head. And I think this will keep people from getting and feeling worse about it, which is silly. And maybe in that guy culture you don't want to be vulnerable, that's too difficult. So how do you get around it? And we published a little bit about we call this hidden medical logic of mental health stigma in the academic literature. Um, some of my colleagues. Um, and my strategy is to, why don't we just start taking all the mental health stuff and stop talking about it in mental health, just bring it into physical health and organic health. Uh, and instead of trying to say, oh, there shouldn't be a split, I just, okay, there's a split. We're then on the body side. Because then we won't have a problem. Some of my people say, oh, no, you've got to, then you're not including the psychosocial part. But I, I, I just want to collude to get better health care for people. So we call this, this paper that strategy. Organic legitimacy is the term. So this is a PET scan, a fancy brain image. It's a little bit old, I just took off the internet. Of a brain lit up in one of these fancy PET scan positron machine to a tomogram machine. All light up, a lot of activity, little reds and yellows. <coughs> this, is, this is if you're lying down, we were looking at a cross section. The black areas are called your ventricles. That's where the cerebral spinal fluid when you look at the brain organ. On the left is a PET scan of a person in a depressive episode deeper colors, less activity. There's less electrochemical activity. The organ is slowed down. So no wonder you feel like crap when the organ slows down. Just like when I turn the engine down or the voltage down on my, on the wattage down on my light bulb, you turn it back up and it lights back up. Exactly that's happening. So it's not effort. When you see it, I think you believe it a little bit. The good news is, with treatment, it lights right back up. The organ starts to work the way. We do this with x-rays with the lungs, right? Maybe you're coughing, no, you're just imagining you're coughing or something wrong. We do an x-ray, there's a bunch of junk here. Of course, you have pneumonia. So this organic legitimacy, I think, is a, a nice way to help um, get people to come to get the treatment. Um, so you can believe in the published. Two more ideas to move the field forward, and I'll just stop and take questions and we'll be done. Um, healthcare is measuring quality of care. Every government is putting out a dashboard, they want to get elected, they want to get green lights. One of the big things they said, wait times in the emergency room. Cut two hours off the wait time, please elect us. That's great. That's one of the quality of care things. But there's six things in quality of care. Safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, they're really hung up. Efficient, the money, and equitable. The sixth pillar of quality of care is equitable, equity. So I've actually stopped talking about believe me, it's mental health, attitude, stigma, and I'm now saying, that's not working because then they just think I'm a protester out on the lawn, right? So I'm now saying, no, I'm not talking about I just want to do quality of care. We have a quality of care committee. The government has a quality of care dashboard. It's just an equity issue. I just want equitable care for all conditions. And let's get equity on that. So mental health stigma and care should just be a quality of care problem under the equity pillar. 
this was a big strategy we published this in the, in the Lancet. It was a big, one of the top medical journals. So I was very pleased with that idea. It hasn't quite happened yet, but it's a reframing uh, of mental health. And, and the service you get is quality of care. Why would we accept less quality for one condition than the other? It should be a red light on the dashboard. It should be. So I'm kind of turning their own mechanisms against them. And those are the six pillars of quality care. And then one last and by equity, I'm not talking the typical equity. I know your, your, your organization is very into gender equity and, and issues specific. But I'm just actually just talking about a fair distribution of resources and space and the same kind of care and services you would get. I think all the doctors should get the same, regardless of specialty. Why should some get more and less? It's, it's just silliness. So that's my version of structural equity that I'm into. Um, so reframing mental health is an equity issue. That's an idea. Uh, in fact, the last thing we just most recently published this past summer uh, in the Lancet was, I think I'd like to develop an audit tool where I go in, because hospitals get accredited every three or four years where everything helps. People go on the scorecard and you know, the pass or fail. Just like they do the restaurants, you know, if they're too dirty, they, get a, they close the restaurant, they get a little grading. So hospitals and health care institutions get graded. Wouldn't it be sneaky to get a mental health equity audit tool created or added to the accreditation? Because they don't they have that clearly have an indicator. They measure how many times we wash our hands in the hospitals, how many hours we wait, but no one's checking out, oh, and why is that dumpy part of the hospital a mental health problem? Every if I could get that as one more thing they'd measure, they'd say, oh, we can't have that. You know, we get fixed. So I'd like to develop an audit tool, an equity audit tool, uh, just to make it equitable care for people. So that's sort of where the equity lens that I brought to the work. The videos are a fun way to get the conversation going, educate people in it by entertaining them first. That was the least fun to watch. Most of them are fun or comical. There was a bit of comedy in it, but it was, that was the most cringeworthy. So thank you for the interest in that one. Uh, there's lots of published on I won't get into that. Uh, that was the November Charity Hughes idea that we got the, uh, the innovation grant from, so I, I thank them immensely for that support. That's the website, thank you, Katrink. Uh, and just to show you the research study, after watching Think You Can Shrink, I feel more comfortable in supporting a friend or family member who has the same health issue, 86% of respondents. Um, after watching Think You Can Shrink, I'm more likely to seek help if I did 75% of respondents. So um, I've got a few people say they don't know how to get their loved one or their partner or somebody to help, depending on the condition. I say, okay, hey, don't try to don't try anymore, but what are you watching tonight? Netflix or what? watch an episode, and that was the thing that turned them because they got into it in a different way, because they're, they're watching the role modeling plan. So that's that's the idea of uh, one strategy, particularly for guys who don't want to go directly at it. Um, an experimental vehicle. And finally we entered the British Medical Journal because there's a whole discussion on suicide on TV through the, the 13 Reasons Why series of adolescents. And so we, I weighed in on that because they want to regulate the industry to not show things like that. I don't think you can regulate the media. I said why don't we just turn the media on themselves and play with it the way uh, so if I could make that into a real show that would be fun. Um, that's where we end up. Thank you. So, questions, comments? Um, yeah. um, I think it's very yes. interesting um, when we talk about Mr. Trudeau, and whenever he does anything good, yeah. they credit his father. Oh. And whenever, whenever he does anything bad, they credit his mother. And oh. everybody knows now she's very public yeah. about her mental illness. Yeah. And I, I mean, this is. 2000s. I mean, yeah. has not gotten any better. I mean, when you're talking about the stigma, I mean, I graduated a long time ago yeah. in the medical field, and it was like that then, and it's still like that. It's a bit better, but there's a long way to go. Yeah. Um, I've met both of them, actually, not murdered her. She spoke at our hospital as a speaker. She's very she's magnetic, wonderful. Uh, uh, wonderful work she's doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I haven't paid attention to her. It's <clears throat> trying to do with what uh, her letter so. Yeah, I don't know. It's still there. But the barrier I'm trying to get to you is that if you know somebody, have somebody, and you think they may be suffering, just encourage them to get help and help them through that self-stigma. It's not your fault. It's not your effort. It's not your, it's just a health condition. Get checked out. But just be understanding. Don't try to solve and badger them what to do. That's, that's really not. Just be, yeah, I hear you. It sounds terrible. If you want some help, maybe we should go get help. I'll, I'll come with you. So that's kind of it. And that little difference, really, I know the thing that the name Say more. That can save a life. It's really, as opposed to missing the opportunity, not somebody's fault, but missing the opportunity, or them never hearing that and never knowing that that's okay. So giving permission and encouragement. 
And you have guys who don't want to be vulnerable to on talk. I'm one of them. I was one. I was a little less enlightened as a youth. Uh, and I'm not that enlightened now, my wife will tell you. So uh, that can really be helpful. So the, the judgment, the jokes, the st like that guy's doing, that's not a helpful strategy for anyone. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I have a big question. Yeah. I, I want to ask the guys in the room what's the matter? I mean, is it matter? No, 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 no. I don't mean to say it like that. But what I mean is, there is nothing to be ashamed of. There is nothing. Yeah. But the disclosure of fellows in yeah. a lot of cases is very difficult for me. So I can tell you what I read in the literature and doing my research for some of the but I think other people, if anybody else wants to say, well, you answer her. Um, well, <laughs> I, like, I was even thinking just now about the, the this is where movement on the, like, uh, TDC or whatever, and I saw this sign there that was talking. It was like, oh, this is where so and so Katie or whoever was was being felt uncomfortable ever and had to stare while she was being leered at or something by a guy, right? And it was just this random part of the bus that I guess she was staring at while somebody was leering at her. But unfortunately, you know, a not only are there tons of people on the TTC that suffer from mental illness, maybe they thought, you know, if we weren't staring at her in some sort of a sexual leer or something like that, which is the suggestion that I bought out of it, but uh, or or with any nefarious sort of. But, but then in the same sense, it's like I felt stigmatized just seeing that. Because for me, you know, maybe I might I, I start questioning if I stare at people. And sometimes I stare at people because, you know, I have a mental illness or something like that, right? Or maybe that, you know, things like that make me feel like I'm, uh, uh, that people think that I'm more mentally ill than I am, you know, because it's like, uh, people think that, uh, you know, guys that, that might stare for a bit too often that that's wrong, well, it's easy to say that, like, that can be linked to a mental illness. And my, my whole thing, too, is that, you know, what is it that keeps people from following the suggestions that they're in, in like, that they get from people in treatment already? Because that's, that's where I feel like already, yeah, you know, getting them in the door is, is a great thing, but it's solving the same problem, figuring that out as well, right? So when I read the literature, they talk about, I mean, guys don't talk as much. They're more physical, and they, they do a little hint pat on the back. So it's, it's less talking, more physicality, more doing stuff together. Um, and guys don't want to look vulnerable. We compete for resources in the socializers. So disclosing vulnerability, not feeling good, and then this social belief that mental health maybe isn't as real illness as others, we combine that to the basic really hard. It's just not the way guys socialize. We solve problems. We do stuff together. That's, but it's changing, but that's where it is. So those are the challenges. So how do you, you could change guy culture, but what some of the organizations or the literature is talking about, or how do you work within guy culture yes. to get it better? Yes. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff <coughs> happening in that realm. I think that's a new era. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just listening to this. So you know, you're saying guy culture. So is this across different nationalities, different continents? Yeah. So it's not culture. This is just how guys are. And by saying guy culture, yeah. you are just completely trashing um, the way that men are. Okay. I mean, I mean it's, not, it's not culture. This is how men are. This is the glory of being a man. Yes. And you're saying this is wrong? No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your, uh, I don't mean to say that, I'm one of them too, so I can say that. <laughs> yeah, but this so is I have saying it's the way. It's the, gen it's the way men generally interact. Yeah, uh, it's and it's no the value. way they interact. Yeah. This gentleman here is saying that, um, uh, and he sees a poster saying that a woman was being stared at. Well, I'm sorry, but um, you know, this is not, um, it's not criminal to be a heterosexual. <laughs> or it just makes me feel like I'm not as insane as maybe my doctor might suggest to me. You'd be like, no, you have mental illness in this. You get what I'm well, saying? Like, you're being told. That uh, your your society your, as your male your, your male behavior is wrong somehow, and that is a problem. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, can I yeah. speak to that? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think there the confusion between just male culture. These cultural things amplify these can amplify these differences because we see them as, as representing um, archetypes. So. The ideal male is not just strong. He's the strongest, right? And he's got to stand behind that all. So there's there's a cultural effect there that amplifies it. It's the same for women. There's certain ideals that are really not functional ideals for women. That they, they're resisting now, 
And we should be resisting some of ours, I think, too. Well, they sure. generally don't talk about their emotions. Sorry? They generally don't talk about their yeah. emotions. They ignore them and hope that they go away. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's a lot That's of good not things necessarily about a good thing when yeah. you've got somebody that, that has issues. Tough it out. Yeah. 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 We're almost done, so go ahead and see. Uh, yeah, um, you, you talk a lot about how mental health is, mental health you see as part of the body and comparing it to other diseases. Um, and one of the things I, I struggle with for understanding that is if you say like pneumonia as an example, we have uh, an idea of what would cause that effect. You know, water in the lungs and the bacteria of a certain type that grows. How, how do we what are the cause, causation yeah. experimental? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think we're just, so we learned about things like pneumonia because when people cough out junk, it comes <laughs> out, and we could put it in a little petri dish and study it. We could look at it under a microscope. And then they built this x-ray machine, which is pretty sophisticated about 100 years ago, but not super sophisticated, and they could just see stuff. The brain is behind this thick bone called the skull, so it doesn't put anything out. You can't stick it under a microscope without taking a biopsy, and that means I have to drill a hole in your skull, so we can't do that yet. And the technology is just starting to get better to do fancier imaging and fancier ways of understanding. So I think the answer is that we haven't figured it all out yet. I can tell you a few things we do know, uh, because the technology is just that much harder to understand and much more complicated already much harder to study like the brain. And I think the technolo technological advances, the imaging, the electron microscopy, the electrical biology, all these fancy things, is going to get there too. It's just a little bit laggy right now. So things that we know, so let's just take the depressive illness for not being sad or down, leaves lose, I'm sad. That's not depression. It's a terrible name because it's a descriptive <coughs> term. Uh, they're going to change the terms pretty soon. The next classification book they're already is probably going to change it to circuitry type names or from these descriptive normal feeling things. I got depressed, I got anxious. I was rushing here, I was anxious. That's not an illness. So the disorders are different. Uh, so when you study the chemicals, you see there are some chemical changes. Some chemicals are a little lower in an episode of depression, the monoamines, serotonin, normal and dopamine. When you feel better or when we use certain medicines, we boost them back to normal and people don't feel better. So that's correlated with these conditions. It's not the cause. We also know people are, have inflammation often during this, it's all the body inflammation during the mood disorders, not only in your brain, but in your the arteries and vessels. So some kind of autoimmune inflammatory stress response going on with your hormones as well. So, and then certain regions of the brain are lighting up more and less. So there's just some kind of change. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying, so we're, we're getting clues closer and some interventions on that, uh, but we don't know the exact cause. And I think it's a clue that's harder to study. And the technology, I'm not a technological guy, but I think the advances in computers and the imaging is going to get us there quicker. There's a lot of excitement about that. But there has been excitement for 50 years in, in small advances, not big ones. So. OK, so I think I, we're about, what time do you guys do the end? Are we about at that time? I don't know what your normal, how, should I take a few more, or are we? Yeah. It's, it's up yeah. to you. Oh, it's up to you. Yeah. Okay. Some time. OK. We can wrap it. Another friend of mine did a series of videos called Locker Room Doctor, where guys are in the locker room or in the hockey because we're in Canada, and then we talk about health conditions in that context. I did one, I did that one. I can show you that was four minutes if you want. It's different. Um, we're probably going to do some more of those. Will they be on the uh, same website? They won't be, they'll be different. They're on the Locker Room Doctor.
common mental health challenges most of us run into as we go about our days. Exercise is good, it gets the heart going, you know, really improves your mood and your anxiety. 
community. It's also important to stay socially connected, so getting out with the guys is great, or sharing experiences with friends. Uh, also, watch out that you're drinking responsibly, don't abuse drugs, and you should be in pretty good shape. Okay. Let's go celebrate. Uh, there's a web, it's, it's not my series, it's uh, Dr. Mike Evans, it's got a bunch of YouTube videos and stuff in his series with the other fellows, so it's on, on the web, you can walk with a doctor, they have other health conditions, that's not the Well, thank you for your attention. Oh, question? Just because it's a, sort of a hot topic, Yeah. Um, with the new marijuana laws coming in, how do you think that's going to affect mental health? <laughs> oh, that's not an easy one. Um, marijuana, new marijuana laws, how will this affect mental health? The, so the problem is there's very little evidence yet medically good, bad, what it does. Other than I can say for a lot of people it can make you anxious, uh, it can make you lack motivation, and it can make some people psychotic. So I working in a first episode of psychosis clinic out uh, in Regent Park area called Steps Program. Uh, now that's a select sample, but I can tell you all the young adults, youth and young adults, pretty much are using marijuana and I, of course they're being treated for psychosis and we're using antipsychotic medicine, but they keep smoking a gram of weed a day with everything. So it's not helping their mental health. Overall the impact, I don't know, but the greater availability will just probably take those vulnerable people and drive more of them to be ill. Now many people may be fine recreationally, with it as well. I don't know. That's what we're, the jury's out. Is it just a select vulnerability or is it causing another? We don't know that yet. What I really resented was the government to get around politically said, oh, if you get a doctor's prescription, it'll be medically prescribed. There's no evidence. I'm not going to get any medication out without evidence. I'm not pro or against marijuana. I don't care. Uh, I will not, as a person who has to be, watch the risk. We require some kind of evidence and studies to prove safety and effectiveness. Where, whether it's marijuana, aspirin, antibiotic, that we need that. And they wanted us to prescribe it and make it okay without any of that. So that was the part about it. So now they've taken it out of their hands, thank goodness. What it'll do is it's a giant social experiment in Canada. Um, I can tell you with the mental health patients who have succumbed to illnesses like psychosis, it is really not good for that. Right. And so the other question was here's another side to that. Age and having young youth have access to that. And how well, that programs uh, their synapses and brain. We're worried about that. I have, I have three children, 23, 20, and 16. Um, the brain is particularly developing up to about age 25. The onset of illnesses like schizophrenia is usually in that window of brain development. It's probably a developmental disease of how the nerves cells prune themselves and grow and what's going on. Um, and it probably messes that up in that very vulnerable, important period. So we're very concerned about it. And so the later the use, or, you know, with some kids a little bit but some get really unwell. So we're very concerned, but uh, I don't know. We're waiting for evidence. So it's a giant social experiment. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I'm curious on that note if it will actually, through legalization for recreational use, make it harder for teens to access. Because I know yeah. when I was in high school, it was incredibly easy okay. to get marijuana, and everyone, and most of the drug dealers were teenagers. <laughs> So it's very, very easy for teenagers to get marijuana through the black market. And so I'm curious if it'll actually make it harder <coughs> if it's legal for 18 plus. And no, I think that could be a positive thing. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the invitation.